Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Lori Smetinka with the Consumer Voice. We are glad to have you with us. As folks are coming into the webinar, I'll cover a few housekeeping items to get us started. Um, first of all, as you heard, today's webinar is being recorded and all of your lines are gonna be muted throughout the throughout. Um, if you have questions, there's a Q&A control box in your control panel. Um, and so please put your questions in there and we'll pull from those at the end of the program and answer as many as we can get to. Please use the chat feature in order to make comments or share information. We'll also be including links in the chat to some of the materials um, and sites that we're talking about today. Um, and uh, also wanted to let you know that today's slides and materials that we'll be referencing will be emailed to all of the registrants after today's program, and they'll also be posted to the Consumer Voices website. So thanks again for being with us this afternoon. So we're having um, this webinar today to talk about um, nursing home staffing and a request that CMS has put out for information around that issue. So as you all know, in late February, the Biden administration released a bold set of reforms to address um, nursing home issues. Um, and they're meant to address longstanding problems that have plagued nursing homes for decades, many of which largely contributed to nursing homes being ill-prepared and ill-equipped to respond to the pandemic, as well as issues that arose because of the pandemic. And one of the cornerstones of the proposed reforms is for the administration to establish a minimum federal staffing standard for nursing homes. So what they're going to be doing is conducting a study to determine the level and type of staffing needed, and then they're going to be issuing proposed rules within a year um, to establish a minimum or baseline staffing standard. As you know, this is something that, can, that the Consumer Voice and many of you have been advocating for for a very long time, um, because we know that the current federal standard requiring sufficient staff is too vague and has allowed too much discretion for some owners and operators to staff at alarmingly low levels. So as it prepares to draft rules around the staffing requirements, CMS has issued this request for information that includes 17 pretty complex questions related to staffing issues. They're seeking feedback that includes research findings, best practices, and personal experiences that will help inform their efforts to craft a minimum standard. Comments are due on June 10th. So it's critically important that as many people as possible submit comments to weigh in on the need for a minimum staffing standard and what it means for residents when there are not enough staff. So the Consumer Voice has been working with our partners from the Center for Medicare Advocacy, the Long-Term Care Community Coalition, Justice and Aging, and California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, as well as Dr. Charlene Harrington on drafting in-depth comments on the questions that have been asked by CMS. Because many of you have also asked for support in drafting your own comments, our five organizations have prepared a draft outline that include talking points, resources, citations, and more. So we're gonna go through that today and hit some of the high points. And you'll be able to pull from this information as you craft your own comments. And we highly encourage you to also include your own experiences and opinions. So to those for whom these, com these comprehensive comments might be beyond the scope of what you can submit, we're also going to be sharing a link to a page on the Consumer Voices website that'll help you prepare comments that express support for a minimum staffing standard and give you the opportunity to focus on your personal experiences. So without further ado, we're going to get started. So my colleagues who will be leading us through the discussion today include Sam Brooks from the Consumer Voice, Richard Mollett from the Long-Term Care Community Coalition, Tony Chicken from California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, Galila Selassie from Justice and Aging, and Toby Edelman from the Center for Medicare Advocacy. And I'm going to turn it over to Richard to get us started. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Lori. Thanks very much. And hi, everyone. Oh, and thanks for moving the slide. That, that's great. So um, what I'm going to talk about is the first four questions in the request for information that Lori was talking about. And from my perspective, they really form kind of a baseline of what should CMS be looking at? What is the baseline for staffing and for expectations? Uh, how do we address costs, et cetera? And to that, we say that we've known for over 20 years now, since the uh, CMS study that was published in 2001, that we need to have, nursing homes need to have at least 4.1 hours per resident day of nursing staff, RNs 
LPNs and CNAs just to meet, to meet the basic clinical needs of residents. Uh, as Lori said, the uh, Biden administration has called for a new study and we completely, uh, I think we all completely support that because if anything, um, the studies over the years uh, that have taken place since 2001 have corroborated the 4.1 hours per resident day study. And if anything, we've seen some of the, the, the better studies in terms of methodology have, have found that a higher level of staffing is needed. So some of the things we talk about and what we included here in the document that, that Lori was referring to that is available to, to all of you uh, on the Consumer Voice website, provide citations to some of the things that we are gonna be talking about today. And again, that are in the expanded version of this. For instance, we cite, and you'll be able to cite to studies that, that have found over the years that nursing staffing and higher levels of nursing staffing are directly correlated to less pain for residents, to less pressure ulcers for residents, uh, less falls for residents, uh, fewer infections, and importantly, as we saw in the last couple of years, less COVID incidents and death were again the result of having higher staffing in nursing. So over and over and over again, we have a strong body of evidence that um, we have cited for you in this, um, in this document that you could use to support your discussions and, and particularly your personal discussions about uh, you know, what you have faced and what your members or, or et cetera have faced, excuse me. Uh, one thing that I want to touch upon before moving on to our next speaker is costs. That was one of the first, it's actually number four in the question here. Uh, is there evidence that resources that could be spent on staffing are instead being used on expenses that are not necessary to quality patient care? And then question three above it, is there evidence of the actual cost of implementing recommendation, recommended thresholds that account for current staffing levels? This, this again, these questions come directly from CMS. So there was a recent study that was done that was very provider industry, uh, um, uh, provider industry focused, excuse me, um, in, in our view. And that study found that it would cost an average of half a million dollars for a facility that is not currently staffing to appropriate standards to meet those standards. Uh, and so that's not a lot of money. I think it came out to about $4.9 billion or about 5%, if I remember correctly, of the national spending on nursing home care to increase to a level that we're providing uh, or have a reasonable knowledge or ability to provide adequate staffing for residents, which of course benefits not only residents, but the important care staff too. Uh, I also wanted to just quickly mention that there is, uh, in relation to number four is, so we, we talk about again, a $5 billion or so 5% uh, increase in costs, but there is a lot of evidence that shows that essentially there is a lot of money floating around in the nursing home industry. We have uh, increased, uh, increased investment by real estate investment trusts, by private equity and other private investment firms, and story after story nationwide of those, those entities pulling money, pulling resources away from resident care. And we're focused today on staffing, but the Biden administration's proposals also talk about greater transparency and accountability for nursing home operations. None of these are a panacea for improving care, but together, especially with the staffing standard, we think there's a long way that they can go. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on to our next speaker, who I think is Sam. Thank you, Richard. Um, that was very insightful and very informative. And I agree uh, that forms really the foundation of where we go with the rest of these questions. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, these next four questions, which we'll be talking about, um, uh, really look at um, some of the challenge that CMS sees um, that to uh, one, retaining and recruiting staff, uh, and then uh, potential issues with facilities that aren't able to uh, obtain staff, things like turnover, and also who should be counted, what nurse, what, what direct care staff should be included in uh, the minimum staffing standard. And again, I encourage you all to use that link that we've posted. It has brief 
statements that you can use in the comments. And it also has links to all of the studies. There's over 132 citations. Some of them are redundant, but they're there and they'll be very helpful to you in your commenting. Um, so uh, what we focused on in a lot of these questions, particularly um, about retaining and recruiting staff is and what I think anyone who uh, is familiar with nursing homes is turnover. Um, CMS estimates annual turnover in nursing homes to be about 53%. Other studies estimate that over 100%. And why is that? So we focus a lot on the issues that cause turnover, which are um, uh, staff leaving and staff leave for very um, specific reasons. There's um, certain, certainly enough studies and academic support to show why staff leave. And that is because wages, lack of paid leave, um, uh, how they are treated by uh, uh, management, um, lack of training, um, lack of uh, uh, career advancement opportunities, and importantly, just huge caseloads. Um, oftentimes, on average, a CNA is handling two times the caseload that they should be. So we walk you through these very important issues, give you some information about just what the issues are and also what some of these solutions are. Um, solutions that are even backed by um, uh, the nonprofit nursing home industry, such as increasing, uh, increasing minimum wage hours. Also, we, we look at you know, just who should be included in a minimum staffing standard. Um, and the evidence for this and the academic support for this really shows that there should only be a few groups included in that, and that's registered nurses, um, LPNs or LVAs and CNAs, um, because those are the staff that are providing direct care. Certainly, certainly nursing home residents can benefit um, for additional support, mental health support, say social work, um, activity support, but there's no evidence to support that those hours um, can replace the necessary direct care needs that residents need. So we go over all of that in, in, in the outline, talk about um, uh, just a lot of these issues that are really going to, we're going to hear from the industry, but we can't hire staff. And we really see the cornerstone of countering that argument is that you have to create good jobs. We have to invest in nursing home staff. Um, and it's important not only um, for resident care, but it's going to help retention and help address the underlying issues um, in uh, nursing homes. And one last thing, um, and before, before we move on here, is question six talks about, um, it's a confusing question and could mislead folks. Um, you know, what should CMS do if there are facilities that can't get adequate staff? How should CMS define a good faith effort? And this is a very confusing question and one that people could get stumped on. We strongly, as a group, oppose any waiver of minimum staffing standards. Minimum staffing standards are just that, they're a minimum, um, below which residents suffer and are at heightened risk of harm and their um, condition can deteriorate. Um, those waivers, those minimum standards should never be waived. Um, what, what CMS requires when facilities are unable to meet the staffing standard is that the new admissions should be halted and other steps should be taken to bring the, bring to, uh, the, the ratio up in accordance with the law. We do not support any waiver of that standard. If CMS here is talking about um, uh, a good faith waiver of other potential penalties, we give some suggestions. Um, but it's not something we compromise when we compromise when we're talking about care for residents. Um, so again, there's there's issues in here, some of them um, that many of you will be familiar with. Again, we encourage you to use your own experience, but please reference this, um, uh, the outline that we're gonna be going through, which will really help facilitate your comments. And with that, um, going quickly here, um, I'm going uh, to turn it over to Galila from uh, Justice and Aging. Great, thank you, Sam. And yes, I'll be uh, pretty quick as well because I know we have a lot to go through. So we were focusing on questions um, nine through 11, which looks at how 
administrative nursing duties should be considered, how minimum staffing requirements should be measured, and how the quantitative requirements should work with the existing qualitative uh, regulatory requirements. So looking at question nine about how administrative nursing duties should be factored, um, we, we recommend that the staffing requirements should really just focus on the direct care of the residents. So if we're using that um, hours per resident day standard, those hours would not include any kind of administrative time because that's taking away from um, what the residents need in order to meet their you know, physical, mental, and psychosocial well-being. And so while administrative duties are important, that should not be part of the, uh, the, the, uh, the minimum requirements, particularly when we're looking at how many um, hours residents or how many hours of care that workers are going to provide for residents as part of the staffing minimums. Um, there's also some support that in existing regulations and existing guidance that resident that you know the administrative work does take away from a resident's direct care needs and we've cited two current regulations that identify that if a, a nursing position is mostly administrative there's limitations to how many beds they can serve and then several states also have restrictions as to when an additional registered nurse is needed if the r and staff also holds administrative responsibilities so there there is some precedence there um, with respect to how administrative or uh, how the administrative world of nursing can kind of contradict some of the direct care work. Um, and then looking at question in 10 about how to measure staffing requirements, and uh, we recommended that both the hours present day standard be used in conjunction, in conjunction with the nurse to resident ratios. The reason for that being is that hours present day does provide a lot of useful um, support and, and recognizing that there's a certain amount of time that each resident needs as a, as a basic floor, as a minimum standard, but it can be a little bit confusing for residents and staff and family members to recognize if there's facility is actually in compliance. And so having a uh, hours per resident day on top of some sort of nurse to resident ratio or nurse aid to resident ratio would be really useful. We also strongly recommend that RNs should be on site for 24 hours a day. These are, by name, skilled nursing facilities, which by uh, you know inherently requires a level of skill and nursing for for people with really high complex needs. We identify that nurse aides and CNAs are absolutely the backbone of nursing homes um, and provide really crucial care. And for those nurse aides to be able to provide that work, they need the assistance and supervision of registered nurses to provide that support, as well as for, for the residents um, as well who do have these complex needs. And we've cited to studies that show how, how useful uh, RNs are and how the higher number of RNs is associated with better outcomes for residents. Um, question 10 also mentioned something about what non-nursing duties should entail, and it's similar to what we said earlier about the administrative nursing requirements. We recognize that other uh, non-clinical, non-nurse aid care or non-nurse aid responsibilities are necessary in a facility, um, whether that's social work responsibilities or others, but that does not need to be counted toward the nursing or direct care hours. Um, and again, we cite the studies showing that if you conflate nursing and direct care duties with other responsibilities, that tends to lower morale and increase turnover, which is what these, uh, which is what we're trying to prevent here. Um, and then looking at question 11 about how the quantitative standards could work with the existing qualitative standards, which is that facilities must have sufficient nursing staff based on the residents' needs. Um, as I mentioned, we support that there should be a quantitative hours per resident day standard and nurse to resident ratio standard, but that could, should work in conjunction with the requirement that facilities have sufficient nursing staff uh, with the appropriate skills and competencies to meet a resident's physical, mental, and psychosocial well-being. And the reason why both of these standards should be in place is that, as I mentioned, the hours present day and, and, and nurse to resident ratios provides a minimum standard, provides a floor, but there are residents that have these higher needs, sometimes it's called acuity, which is when a resident has complex needs that can't be um, sort of uh, conflated with, with the rest, with what our standard resident hours would be. And so having the sufficiency, you know, uh, qualitative standard gives residents and facilities some room to make sure that they're, uh, you know, not just treating all residents in a one size fits one category, but really providing that direct targeted care for residents with higher needs. And facilities can use the minimum data sets or the MDS uh, to determine what those needs should be. And then lastly, there's a quick uh, sort of add-on question on part the end of 
Question 11 about how overtime, state overtime regulations and laws uh, could interact with the minimum staffing requirements. We really believe that the focus should not be on overtime. The idea is to maintain and recruit a high number of direct care workers for facilities um, to provide uh, quality care during a during during work hours during their regular shifts and or, and I think focusing on overtime would make it seem as if the facilities should just hire a smaller number of workers to provide a ton of care um, beyond their 36 or 40 or whatever hours. And that can lead, we cited in some instances where that can lead to physical injury for staff as well as high burnout, high turnover, and uh, re really some, some negative outcomes for residents. Um, and so that is it for those questions. We obviously have, have a bit more detail in the, uh, in the materials. And with that, I think I am passing it over to either Tony or Mike, or both. Yeah, hi, thanks, Galila. This is Tony Chikatel. I'm with California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. I uh, wanted to, before I get into the questions, just emphasize again how important it is for there to be robust comments in favor of a minimum staffing requirement. Um, I'm thinking about all the people I talk to in the course of a day or a week and advocate for better care, better conditions, better uh, compliance with resident rights and things like that. Understaffing is almost always part of the story, if not the, the bulk of the story. I'm thinking if, if our advocacy can raise the minimum by just one tenth of an hour per resident per day in a typical 100 bed facility, that means we're gonna have an additional staff person of 10 hours a day providing critical care. That's, that's 10 more hours a day of someone to help shower residents, to clip fingernails and toenails, to brush teeth, to turn and reposition, to, to take their time um, in providing care and having more meaningful interactions, more meaningful conversations and engaging residents where they are. I just think this is the, the I, I cannot overstate how important this is what a critical juncture this is for uh, the welfare of nursing home residents in this country going forward. We can have a huge impact the more comments we're able to generate. Um, okay, so now I'll get to my questions. Essentially, I have two sets of questions. 12 and 13 are asking about what the states have done. And I think that's a good focus for CMS, um, the laboratory of democracy in the states. How is it going in states that have mathematical minimum staffing requirements? What can we learn, uh, both positive and negative from those experiences? And then the question 14 is about RN, uh, registered nursing 24 seven in facilities. So with regard to the states, the questions really get at what can we learn? Are, these, are there states that can serve as models for us? And the answers that we put in our sample response is sort of yes and no. The yes part is it's great to have a, min a mathematical minimum staffing requirement. Um, and it's really a simple logic here. It's that you, you create a number that's required. There is to some degree compliance uh, among the facilities. They raise their staffing levels. And we know that raised staffing levels generates better outcomes for residents. So it's, you have a mathematical minimum, uh, staffing goes up, and as a result of staffing going up, we have better outcomes for residents. So that we know that works, and there's plenty of studies to cite about that. Um, the part that we don't that where we want to be a little bit skeptical of the state um, lessons is that most of, if not almost all of, the states have set their standards too low. Um, they're not high enough to guarantee the kind of minimum. Uh, care that we would want our residents to get. Uh, so there's no state out there that's done it particularly well. Um, it's good that, they, that there are states with minimums. I think Washington DC is the only example of a, of a state or local requirement that's above the 4.1 hours per resident per day that we see as the absolute minimum. So there's definite lessons to learn, um, but we, I think we want the feds to do better than what the states have done. Then there's a couple in the in the model. There's a couple of granular, more granular issues within these two questions. One is um, that we, uh, as and Sam got into this a little bit, that we don't want to lump all the care all the caregivers 
classifications as one because we've learned from certain state examples when you do that, the facilities tend to, to um, hire more of the lower paid, less skilled staff to make up that number. And we've seen in some states the, the number of registered nurses licensed uh, vocational nurses actually go down as a result of these minimums, which, which may counterbalance the improved uh, outcomes for residents. Um, the other granular issue that we think might be a, approached in question 13 is to, is to criticize the use of feeding assistance in lieu of certified nursing aides. Um, that there's some, a lot of states that have approved certified nursing or uh, feeding assistance at, in place of CNAs and counting those hours as direct care staff. Uh, we think that having such a narrowly focused staff person um, is not a good idea that we would rather have someone who could provide for what resident well-being in a more holistic way. And that um, we should not count certified uh, nursing assist, uh, feeding assistance in the direct care staff number. All right, so the question 14, 24 seven RNs, um, to use a baseball analogy, which I'm apt to do, this is like a batting practice fastball right down the middle. Um, there is enormous consensus. And I think even from the industry to some extent that 24 seven RN presence is critical. It is, um, it's, it's the, um, a big difference in terms of quality of care. There's lots of um, reasons to, for our, that are lots of reasons why RNs bring such um, important improvements in, in resident care. And we've got studies listed regarding that. Um, the one thing that we also wanted to mention on this is that there can be some potential cost savings for Medicare and Medicaid programs. Uh, the more we use RNs, uh, the use of RNs is highly correlated with fewer hospitalizations and other negative outcomes that cost a lot of money in the Medicare and Medicaid program. So uh, if you can stress that, I think that's important to note as well. And that's it for questions 12 through 14. I think the next speaker is going to be Toby Edelman. Thank you, Tony. Um, I'm Toby Edelman with the Center for Medicare Advocacy. And I fully support everything that everybody has said, particularly the need for everybody to submit comments and tell your experiences. These are very important and meaningful to CMS. Why does this matter? Why does staffing really matter to people? And they need to understand it. I know they've been very moved and uh, uh, appreciative of the uh, videos that Consumer Voice has made available of interviews with residents. This is really important information and we need to share this. Okay, I have the final three questions. Um, question 15 is about unintended consequences of minimum staffing ratios, how to mitigate them, and what about those innovative care options, the small facilities like greenhouses? Well, we know that an unintended consequence of staffing ratios has been the substitution of lesser trained uh, licensed nurses like LPNs for registered nurses. And about 20 years ago, both Ohio and California enacted staffing ratios, but they did not distinguish between RNs and LPNs and CNAs. They just said nurses. Well, not surprisingly, what the researchers found is that nurse staffing levels went up, but there were fewer registered nurses, more licensed practical nurses, and more CNAs. That's not good. As Tony said, we really need registered nurses. The research literature is very clear that registered nurses are absolutely essential for quality of care in nursing homes. And I would just add that Charlene Harrington, Professor Harrington from the University of California, San Francisco, um, has made available to us uh, the hundreds, literally hundreds of staffing studies over the decades showing the importance of staffing. And I actually would like to challenge the industry to come up with some studies saying that having fewer staff is really better for residents, leads to better resident outcomes. I think they can't, they can't find any of those studies because it's not true. So the one concern for staffing ratios is substituting staff with less training for more experienced staff or, or staff with more training, registered nurses. The other unintended consequence that the researchers found was that as nursing staff went up, non-nursing staff also declined. So there were fewer food service workers, fewer activities workers, fewer housekeeping staff, 
very serious problems. We need to make sure that CMS not allow facilities to reduce the number of non-nursing staff um, and also not shift these non-nursing tasks to nurses. That's also unacceptable. So that's very important. The second part of question 15, you can see these questions have enormous numbers of questions included in them. Uh, this is about the alternative care settings. Well, we know from research about the greenhouse model that even though the Shabazim, the CNAs, were performing non-nursing tasks, what the researchers found is that the residents in those greenhouses nevertheless receive more, more um, minutes per day, 24 minutes per day, of direct care time from the CNA than residents in traditional nursing homes. They, con they concluded that the greenhouse model allows for expanded responsibilities of CNAs in indirect activities and more time in direct care activities and engaging directly with residents, which we know of course is important, not just care, but for quality of life. Somebody sit down and talk and say, how are you doing today? So I think what this research shows is that these alternative care settings, certainly the greenhouses that they studied can meet any minimum staffing standards that CMS might enact without the need for any accommodation or reduction in those standards. This, the next question, 16, is about geographic disparity in workforce uh, for rural and underserved areas and what to do about that. To me, an important point to make here is that a minimum nursing standard uh, is the standard that must be met by all facilities. We are not aware of any evidence or have any reason to believe that residents who live in rural nursing homes or other underserved areas have lower nursing needs than other residents, and probably to the contrary. We know that as uh, residents of rural communities and underserved areas have had years of poorer health care, they are likely less healthy than other nursing home residents. So the needs are the same. They need to meet the same standard once CMS determines what that minimum standard should be. We know that rural areas have more difficulty in getting staff. But those problems aren't new. The Institute of Medicine identified staffing challenges for rural nursing homes 40 years ago. The problems, the same as they are now about staffing challenges, and the solutions were also the same. Do additional educational outreach, upgrade staffing, pay appropriately. A more recent study about 10 years ago looked at rural nursing homes in Colorado, Idaho, Nevada, uh, Utah and Wyoming. And they did some qualitative discussions with the administrators and directors of nursing homes in rural facilities that had higher staffing levels. And they said, what do you attribute your higher staffing levels to? They said, a good reputation, being flexible and offering individual growth opportunities such as school reimbursement. That's what they found made it, made it easier for them to, to uh, retain, retain, recruit and retain nursing staff. The conclusion of the study is that complex labor pool challenges require, quote, complex solutions. And the solutions were better wages, better health insurance, and better pensions, as well as improved training, supervision, and mentoring. These are the same things we talk about for all facilities. Staffing standards, staffing ratios are essential. We know we have to have them, but they're not the only thing that has to happen. People need to get better salaries. Um, as Tony said, we, I think it was Tony, uh, the leading age report about um, paying a, a living wage could pay for itself just by improving quality of care. That is what Leading Age said a couple of years ago in their study. We know we need paid health benefits. People went to work sick during the pandemic because they didn't have paid health benefits. If they didn't work, they didn't get paid. If you're getting nine, $10 an hour, you don't really have $25,000 sitting in the bank that you could uh, draw on if you aren't getting paid. So there are lots of things that need to be done to improve staffing. A minimum staffing standard is essential, but it's not the only thing. And the problems in rural communities are, are maybe higher, more of them, but it's the same problems that all facilities have in trying to recruit staff. So the last question, 17, what constitutes an acceptable level of risk 
of harm? Well, this question <laughs> was very troubling to us. And we've been talking about it, uh, the groups that have been presenting today have been talking about this for quite a bit. Uh, we didn't really even understand what it means. We don't see anything in the reform law that talks about an acceptable or unacceptable risk of harm as the measure for care quality or the measure for what level of care facilities need to provide. So this is how we decided to answer this question. We think that, uh, we think that the 1987 nursing home reform law and its regulations set the standards in multiple places and put specific responsibilities on the secretary and on facilities to define and meet outcomes of care and process. First, the reform law. The law says the secretary has the duty and responsibility, quote, to assure that requirements which govern the provision of care in facilities and enforcement of such requirements, enforcement, are adequate to protect the health, safety, welfare, and rights of residents, and to promote the effective and efficient use of public monies. There are two responsibilities here. Make sure that standards and enforcement protect residents, everything, health, safety, welfare, and rights, and make sure that the money, the public money we are giving nursing homes under Medicare and Medicaid, make sure they're effectively and efficiently used. These two duties, I think, give the secretary ample authority to develop and enforce minimum mandatory staffing standards. But second, the law and regulations require facilities not only to meet any minimum standards that the secretary might set, but also to increase those staffing levels as needed to meet their own residents' specific and actual needs. We know that facilities are required under the law to conduct and update comprehensive assessments of each resident. Then they're supposed to develop and implement comprehensive plans of care based on these assessments and then quote, provide services to attain or maintain the highest practicable, practicable physical, mental, and psychosocial well being of each resident. In addition to this standard that's been there for a long time from the beginning of the reform law in 87. In 2016, uh, the Obama administration in the revised requirements of participation added a new requirement for a facility assessment. This requirement in the regulations requires each facility at least annually and more often as necessary to conduct an assessment to quote, to determine what resources are necessary to care for its residents competently, close quote. The assessment has to address the care needs of the, of the facility's resident population, their own residents. Who are they providing care to? What are their specific diseases, conditions, physical and cognitive disabilities, overall acuity, other pertinent facts? What are the staff competencies that are necessary to meet the needs of their residents? And any ethical, ethnic, cultural, or religious factors that may potentially affect the care provided by the facility. The nursing services regulation, which was revised because of this facility assessment requirement now says, this is the standard for nursing homes. The facility must have sufficient nursing staff with the appropriate competencies and skill sets to provide nursing and related services to assure resident safety and attain or maintain the highest practicable physical, mental and psychosocial well-being of each resident as determined by residents' assessments and individual plans of care and considering the number, acuity, and diagnoses of the facility's resident population in accordance with the facility assessment as required by section 483.70E. <coughs> that gives the responsibility to increase staffing if the facility's residents need more staff. So I believe that these specific mandates of the law and the regulations require facilities to meet minimum staffing standards and to provide higher levels of staffing in order to provide each resident and all of the residents in the facility with all of the care and services they need to maintain their highest possible functioning and enjoy high quality of care and quality of life. So the, that's the last question. We have lots of, um, as Sam said, lots of resources in the materials and 
happy to, I guess, send this back to Lori for okay. questions. Thanks, Lori. Great. Thanks, Toby. And thanks to um, all of my other colleagues for going through the different questions. As you can see, there's a lot that is being asked and they're very complex issues. They're not easy to answer. And um, so we wanted to provide as much support to all of you as possible. And as several of my colleagues said, we strongly, strongly encourage everyone to provide um, comments, whether you um, respond to all of the questions or a portion of them or even just share your stories about why minimum staffing standards are required. Those are important as well. The slide that you see before you now includes a link to the document in the Federal Register, which, in, which is the request for information and includes the list of questions. Um, it starts um, on the page that you see in the middle there, 22720. Um, and in the bottom right corner on the slide, you see the link to where you would need to submit any comments that you're going to make. Comments can be uploaded um, if you have a separate document or you'll be able to paste your comments into a comment box on that site. And as I mentioned, they're due on June 10th. Um, the document that we've shared in the link, and it's going to be posted to the Consumer Voices website and um, potentially to our colleagues' websites as well if they choose to share it. You can certainly share from that document um, and use uh, some of the different um, elements that we've talked about there in your comments as well. Um, if you go to the next slide, Libby, uh, we know that not all of you um, are looking to go in depth or provide um, sp very detailed comments on all of the questions. Um, but again, um, whatever you're able to do is really helpful. And as much as you're able to um, provide an answer with respect to questions, that is uh, really appreciated by CMS. They have not only been engaging with um, all stakeholders that represent all aspects of the long-term care community, including um, consumer advocates, including nursing home representatives, um, physicians, doctors, uh, direct care worker representatives, unions. They've also been meeting with residents and families um, about these different issues and why staffing is critically important. Um, so because we know, again, that not all of you want to do very detailed comments, um, we've also prepared um, a... a shorter um, set of uh, uh, language that you can use that will um, help facilitate you adding your story um, and why you believe minimum staffing standards are needed into um, a comment page on the site. And we've, we've, what you see now in front of you is a link to a page on the Consumer Voice website that will direct you through how to submit comments. And these directions will be useful whether you provide very in-depth ones or whether you just choose to do something and paste it into the comment box. Um, you can follow the directions here and it'll take you step by step through. Um, and by Monday, we'll have a, a short video um, actually showing you step by step also how to go through the comments that um, that you can just watch and it'll take you through it as well. So um, with that, we wanted to open up, we know there are a few questions um, in the box. And so we're going to open up to answer some of the questions. Um, again, the link to the slides is in the chat. The link to the document um, that we've talked about, that we've been talking about today is also in the chat. They'll be sent out to you along with the link to the recording of um, today's webinar um, to all registrants after so that you can listen again because we're highly entertaining, the, the group of us. Um, so uh, you'll be able to um, listen to aspects of the recording as well. Um, and certainly if you have questions, you can reach out to any of us and we'll do our best to provide assistance to you. Um, so with that, um, there are a few questions. First of all, um, the first one is, do I have to answer all of the questions or can I just respond to some of them? And um, Sam, I noticed you put a mark on that one. Do you wanna just respond to that? Well, I think you just answered that question yeah. very, very well. I just, I mean, this is certainly an over. If this is overwhelming for us as advocates to do this as a job, forty probably more hours than that a week, it's going to be overwhelming um, for um, folks who don't. And again, and I think we have reiterated this. And Tony said this so eloquently. This is about residents, and they need to hear. We're 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 voices for residents, and they need to hear from you and your individual experience, coupled with some of this stuff that we've shared today, but how important 
I mean, uh, Melody, who said in the comments, people have to wait four hours, in, sometimes waiting in their own um, excrement or on the ground or on the floor. And that's about staff. So if you don't answer even one of these questions, we hope you do, but if you go and say, this is important and why, that's, this is about, you know, in, this is about residents. It's not about nursing homes. It's not about us. It's about making sure residents are protected and safe. So you don't have to answer all the questions. We provided this information certainly to help facilitate that, um, but do not let the, overwhelming amount of information here that they're asking for um, to, uh, intimidate you or prohibit prohibit you from um, sharing your experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, so there is a question um, about uh, there's a lot of money in the nursing home industry, but the community options that should be prioritized are struggling to hire people and pay them enough to stay. Um, and so we understand that there are real issues with attracting staff and caregivers in all settings. Um, in community-based settings, um, there's been legislation proposed to try to address and encourage um, support for people that are working in those areas um, and as well as nursing homes. We're talking specifically about nursing homes today because we have this opportunity opportunity to influence what potentially could be the establishment of a minimum staffing standard. Um, and we know that some of the arguments back are that, um, that nursing homes uh, can't find people to hire um, or pay them enough to um, stay in the facilities um, and work there. Um, so I'm going to turn it to my colleagues because I know I know this was touched on earlier in your comments, Richard, um, but certainly um, if anyone else wants to address any of those can't find people and can't pay them enough. Anyone else want to make comments about that? Uh, this is Richard. I would just quickly say that, uh, you know, as I think Sam said before, this is a self-perpetuating problem that the nursing home creates and uh, to repeat myself it perpetuates as well because of the high turnover rates as sam said we have studies that have shown turnover rates from between 50 to well over 100 percent for rns uh lpns and cnas and even higher one study i saw recently was like 126 percent um, turnover for cnas you cannot sustain a uh a stable working or care environment if you are not sustaining your staff, both in terms of providing decent working conditions and providing a livable salary. So I think that's important. And I would just really ask, I know there were a lot of comments like this one about uh, home and community-based services. As Lori said, this is so crucial. And as others, Tony and, 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 and Toby and Sam and Galea said as well, this is our opportunity to make positive difference for nursing home residents. We all support people getting care in the least restrictive setting, most home-like setting possible for them, wherever that is. Um, but it is absolutely crucial that everyone who has the slightest bit of interest in what goes on in nursing homes um, take even a few minutes, as Sam just said, to make a you know to make a statement, make a comment, as long or as short as many of these points as you want to, or as few. But it's so so critical. So um, please, please, I would ask people to really focus on nursing homes and understand that. I think we would say we want all workers to be well paid and well trained. There should be universal training, and there should be living wages for all people who are doing this important work. And mm -hmm. that's you know there are so many issues, but we don't want to have the community advocates and the nursing home advocates fighting each other because people move from one setting to another, the workers move from one setting to another, all of the workers need to be well paid, all of them need to be well trained and treated well. Right. So if we don't, we, we can't allow that kind of uh, competition that if we improve it for nursing homes then home care won't get anything that that's not what we're trying to do and it shouldn't be acceptable. We can train everybody and pay everybody a decent mm -hmm. wage. And certainly support people's access to receiving care wherever it is that they want to receive care. Um, so we've, we've all supported that as well. Um, there is um, a, a comment about needing sample comments letters for residents and families um, for that, you know, maybe I think the the thought is that um, what we've been talking about today is a little too comprehensive or extensive for some folks um, to submit, and we totally recognize that. On the last slide that we shared with you again, there's a much shorter, more compact um, 
uh, recommended language that you can use and you can insert your own story um, in there as well. And you can just take that language and adapt it however it fits for you. Um, and you can then take that and submit it uh, in the comment page. So um, definitely please uh, look at the web page that's linked on the last slide. Um, and we'll be sending that out again to all of you um, in the next couple of days when we send out the email with this information, as well as doing an e-blast early next week. Um, let's see, is anyone looking at nonprofits that are doing exceptionally well? Does anyone want to touch that question? I saw this question and it popped up to me. I mean, <laughs> one thing that we need to make clear is that when you look at the data, particularly from CMS, and you look at um, staffing data, homes that do better on all five-star ratings, including health inspections, um, uh, staffing and overall ratings have higher um, staffing hours per day. And so that's true for nonprofits and that's true for for-profit homes. So homes that are investing in staffing and using that money um, certainly um, uh, perform better. And it's true, nonprofits <laughs> in, in many instances, according to CMS data, perform much better um, around staffing than uh, for-profit homes. And um, the question is why, why is that? And I think um, we can all draw um, probably uh, the appropriate inf um, inference from that. But CMS data shows that across the board, um, uh, nonprofits do do better um, in providing more care and also in, in other ratings. Not all nonprofits and it's not all uh, for-profits, but um, we do, uh, the, the moral from that or the thing to take away from that is that more staffing means better outcomes for residents. And that's what this is about. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to make a comment? Okay. Um, some folks are sharing examples of stories and the questions, and those are the types of things that you need to be sharing um, in your comments. Like, what are the specific things that occur? How does this affect residents when there are not enough staff to meet their needs? And so some of the examples that are being shared should absolutely be shared um, in the comments. Um, will a recording of the webinar be available? Uh, yes, it'll be on the Consumer Voices website and we'll be sending out a link to our all participants. Um, and there was a question about um, the information that's been shared today. You can feel free to share the recording and the links that we've been sharing with you today um, broadly across your networks and please encourage um, folks in your own networks to um, submit comments. Again, they're due June 10th. Um, and as has been mentioned before, it really is critically important um, to provide the information, to raise the consumer voice, to raise the, the voice of the residents and the families to say, this is important to us and we need this to happen now. Um, and we can't wait any longer for minimum staffing standards. Um, consumer Voices was referenced before, did a study last year looking at state staffing standards and only one state, the District of Columbia, currently requires 4.1 or more hours per resident day. Every other state falls below that. Um, and in the 2001 research that was referenced at the beginning of today's webinar, um, it was determined in that research that going below 4.1 hours per resident day increases the likelihood of harm um, and poor outcomes for residents. So that's why you know, we're, we desperately need a federal standard to be put into effect. Um, let's see. Uh, other questions, sharing the link. Um, Libby, could you put the links again in the chat before we close for today so that folks can get them? And um, just checking any other questions here. Non but the profits, and, and it's a comment. So, um, well, I think we've covered all the questions for today. So I'd like to thank um, Sam, Toby, Richard, Tony, Galila, um, Mike's not on camera, but he's there as well. Thanks to all of you for your work um, on pulling the comments together. Thanks so much for participating in this today and uh, certainly reach out to us if you have questions, um, but please submit comments and uh, we appreciate all that you are doing on behalf of residents. Um, um, and thanks so much. Have a good rest of the day. Thanks, everyone.